Did you see the interview? You know, you know the one I'm talking about. Meghan and Harry. Ooh. This wasn't just airing dirty laundry. It was like putting your socks on a flagpole and not the nice ones. The ones that your wife's been trying to get, telling you to get rid of for years and years. They've got big old holes in them. And virtually everybody was upset, weren't they? For the Republicans, uh, it was evidence of bad things at Buckingham Palace. For our royalists, it was betrayal of the deepest held values of who our royal family is at the core. If the, one of the, the, the key, clear old mottos for the royal family was never complain, never explain, then someone didn't give Meghan and Harry the memo. Wow. But at its heart, though, the question is raised. What does it mean to be the British royal family? What does it mean to be royal at all? For us as Christians, what does it mean to be a king? Oh, this new vicar's stirring up the hen house today. If I've got you two stirred up today, some of you have got you stirred up already. Press pause, go and make a cup of tea and come back in a second. But the same question is right there in the Gospels. What does it mean for Jesus to be a king? Let's pray as we get into this wonderful passage. Father, we pray that you would illumine our minds, illumine our hearts today. King of kings, Lord of lords, speak to us. We want to know more of you. In Jesus' name, amen. So today is Palm Sunday. People like it. Normally we get together, we wave around these palm cross things. We give them out to the kids. Uh, the kids turn them into swords uh, and we hope maybe the vicar has been able to organise a donkey. No donkey this year. I blame it on COVID. But what is Palm Sunday all about? What is the point? You know, when Jesus draws near to Jerusalem, something big is happening. Something new is happening. And we know this partly because he gets a donkey. Have you ever noticed that Jesus basically walks everywhere? If he had a fish bit, bit a fish bit, a fit bit, he'd be smashing those 10,000 step targets. You know, Israel isn't that big. It's about the size of Wales. But I don't know about you. I don't want to walk around Wales. It's not that big for a country, but it's still a big country. But Jesus walks everywhere constantly. And, you know, he's never in a flap. Jesus is never in a hurry. He's never rushing. Walking, you know, he can talk with his disciples. Walking, he can pray. Walking, he can do Jesus things, heal people and stuff. God on earth, God on earth travels three miles per hour. There's no compulsion, there's no busyness to him. Ease and peace, Jesus walks. You know, sometimes when I'm praying, I'm like, God, why haven't you done this yet? Or, or why haven't you done that? You know, I, I want to go on. I was taking my... Uh, my kids to school the other day and I was going to speed limit and we were a little bit late and, and they said to me, can't you go a bit faster? And you know, I could have done, but I would have broken the speed limit, so I didn't. But walking, you can't go any faster. It will take as long as it takes. You know, in the coming months, we're as a church thinking about how we might grow our own discipleship. And we're wondering, Maybe the Lord's moving in this way, whether there's some people amongst us that would like to start uh, a church pilgrim group, a church walking group, to be able to walk, pray together, to talk on a regular basis, to walk just like Jesus walked. And if you'd like to be part of that, then do get in touch and let me know. Anyway, Jesus is never in a hurry. And the reason Jesus is never in a hurry is because he's in control. And in this story, he gets an upgrade. Now, it's not exactly impressive upgrade. If you get upgraded on the plane, you get all excited. But then the stewardess might tell you you're in the cargo hold. You see, Jesus' upgrade from walking is, it, it is a donkey. A donkey is a donkey. 
it's not one of those situations where, you know, biblical scholars come in and tell you something you didn't know already, where, oh, in the ancient world, donkeys were really significant, uh, you know, like they do in, you know, and they worshipped or something like in Egypt with cats. No, no, it's not anything like that at all. It's still, it's still a donkey. So that the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one who creates through the power of his voice alone, born before all worlds, rides uh, a donkey. It's like a billionaire that walks into a uh, hotel wearing a tracksuit. He doesn't need to try. Jesus doesn't need to try. And he doesn't need to assert his authority through flash or big symbols. So why a donkey? Well, Luke makes, allows us to, to cut, uh, connect the dots ourselves, dots ourselves, but Matthew makes it explicit by referencing Zechariah 9. The gentle king will come riding a donkey. You know, Jesus knows himself as the king who is one, the one called, equipped and prophesied about hundreds of years before, and he calmly steps into it. You know, uh, you all have heard prosperity preachers. If you haven't done, go and switch onto some of the channels on TV. You all heard uh, some prosperity preachers out there saying, you know, if you follow Jesus, then you'll be rich and he'll give you a, a, a Mercedes. Uh, you know, the Lord will give you all your heart's desires. If that's a Lambo, that's a Lambo. If it's a Mercedes, a Mercedes. You know, that old song that used to be on the advert, oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? But you want to follow Jesus Christ. This guy rides a donkey. So all those prosperity guys need to maybe read uh, this a bit closer. Verse 35, as Jesus went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. The whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for the miracles they'd seen. How many coats have you got? Two, maybe three, uh, maybe a cold weather one, maybe a wet weather one, maybe a couple more in the back of the cupboard with a few moths in, shabbier ones you haven't replaced yet, uh, but you haven't thrown out. But in the ancient world, you couldn't just pop to M&S or Primark. Your garments are few and far between. Washing them is a nightmare. You're chucking them under a donkey. Why? Verse 38. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. The crowd are singing Psalm 118, one of the most significant bits of the Old Testament for the earliest Christians. But if you look at the text really closely, blessed is the king. Blessed is the king. Jesus doesn't become king by entering the city. He's already the king coming into his home city. It's already his, and he's just letting his people know what kind of king he'll be. When I moved in here, uh, just, just before I moved in, we came and we planted five, six little trees. We got five apple trees, uh, all local southwest breeds, and one pear tree in the garden. And I was gardening, so I was filthy dirty. I had my big old hoodie on, my wellies. And someone from the church really kindly looked over the wall and went, uh, excuse me, who are you? Until they recognized me. I was already appointed. I was already ordained. I actually already had the keys. I just hadn't started yet. Jesus is born a king. And riding into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday is the moment when the ancient city is called to receive its king and the question is hanging not on jesus it will he be the king but on the city will you receive your king it doesn't and next week we'll see this king lifted up and crowned with thorns so what kind of song we've been looking at the songs of scripture this is the last one in that series what this is the last one in that series um, what kind of song is this? It's a coronation song. It's like God saved the queen, but this time it's flipped. Now it's God, our king, save us. God, our king, save us. And being a Christian is partly singing that song to recognize that kingship of Jesus, to see it and say, yeah, 
I'll follow him. To say, I want you to be king in all bits of my life, not my way, but your way. Take me in. I will have faith. That is, I will trust in your kingship, in this king. You know, it's been a long time since we've had a new king in this country, a new king or queen in this country. So I had to look this up. But when, uh, we're not looking forward to today, but when our queen dies, the moment she dies, Prince Charles will be king. So it's not the coronation that makes him king. He's already going to be king as soon as our queen dies. It's immediate like that. And whether we like it or not, whether you like Charles or whether you think he's the, the, whether you don't like him, you think he's the worst or whether you think he's the best, he'll still be our king in this country. The question won't be whether he is your king, it's what kind of king he will be. And the challenge from our story is what type of king is Jesus? You know, the old story that what really people wanted was a big king sweeping into the capital, kicking out the Romans and making world domination for Israel. And what they get is Jesus riding on a donkey. And the temptation for us, you know, 2000 years later is to say, ha ha, how wrong they were, but they didn't know. But sometimes I wonder this is the difficult bit. Sometimes I wonder, where, Wilton, whether we have accepted the type of king that Jesus is. You see, the man that we follow is the one who had nowhere to lie his head. He wasn't physically attractive. He hung out with prostitutes and cheats. He finished up getting arrested, killed and publicly shamed. And it doesn't take a degree in theology to realise this is not the normal path, path to success or starting a new religion. The guy comes in on a donkey. I just got to say it again. It's a donkey. Because he doesn't need the trappings. You know, God already has the abundance. He's striding into the city with confidence. He's already got it. He ain't forcing it. Contrast this with the king's uh, the rulers of North Korea or Russia, all those military parades uh, with their missiles, or the kid at school who would boast about how tough he was, all that outside, outside show of strength because they're afraid and are desperately holding on to that status. You know, at times in the history of our church, uh, not Wilson, but the wider church, we've made that mistake of trying to pretend that our strength was in gold or numbers. And we've forgotten that God doesn't need defending. He doesn't need us for that. For if we didn't praise, it says at the end of our passage, if we didn't praise, the rocks would cry out. If we didn't praise, the rocks would cry out. So in Jesus, what kind of king have we got? We've got a king where all creation will worship him. The Psalms say uh, that the whole of creation, the whole of the stars, sing the praises of our God. When our passage we had last week, we saw that little glimpse of heaven where hour after hour, day after day, throughout eternity, the elders sing the song of praises of our king. Jesus says, if we didn't praise, the rocks would cry out. He has it all. It's all his. So when he steps into Jerusalem, he's saying, I have it all. Do you want to be part of it or not? Will you receive me as your king? Will you take me as your king? And whether you like it or not, he is your king. It's about whether we receive that and work with it and accept it. In Jesus, God walks gently amongst us three miles an hour and says, follow me. Let's go for a walk together. Wilton, let us walk with the Lord. Let us follow the one who rides the donkey, slowly but joyfully. For despite all the outside trappings, 
He is our King. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have sent Jesus. You revealed yourself as this gentle King who comes and draws us in and says, follow me. Give us the heart, give us the will, give us the way to follow him. Show us your way and your will. Lord, we want more of you. And we pray as that we think about our mission in this place, as we share out that wonder, wonder that you are our king, that others would come forward and that they would say, yeah, I'll follow him too. We pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.